All right, we'll get going with, with today's material. Uh, so as a reminder, if you're thinking about the exam next week, I'll be back here at uh, 3 p.m. for a review of that stuff. But uh, for now, we're going to just focus on some of the new material, which, again, won't be on the exam, uh, but will be on the third midterm and the final. So we started in Chapter 1 last time and talked about uh, you know, change in energy and how it's related to the, the sum of the heat and the work that are involved in that in that transformation. And when we, uh, when we have an energy change, there's always going to be energy flowing from the system to the surroundings or vice versa, because energy is conserved over the whole universe. So today we're going to learn about how to measure uh, different change in energy, especially those involving heat transfer. Um, so that's what we call calorimetry. All right, so... First, let's talk about what a calorimeter is. Um, you may do, I, don't, I, I have very poor knowledge of what happens in the, in the lab for this course, I should learn, but um, the calorimeter is a device used to measure heat transfer between, um, between a system and the surroundings, and a very simple model is just basically a coffee cup with a thermometer in it. It's, it's about as simple as it gets. Um, so the idea here is that we're going to measure heat transfer between the system and the surroundings. And, and the reason that this is important is because, you know, the, the surroundings, like I said, is the whole rest of the universe. So in a normal situation, whatever heat is lost from the system or gained by the system goes to or comes from the whole rest of the universe, which is a, a hard system, you know, a hard uh, thing to measure. So we, ha we have to contain the surroundings using a calorimeter. So the calorimeter is used to measure heat. And there's two different kinds that we'll learn about. The simple one is the constant pressure calorimeter. And like I said, the idea here is that we're containing the surroundings because we're using an insulated uh, container so that the heat that is lost in the surroundings doesn't just go everywhere. It's contained inside of the calorimeter, so that makes, us much easy, makes it much easier for us to measure what's going on because our surroundings are no longer the entire universe. They're just a small <laughs> coffee cup. Um, because it's a constant pressure calorimeter, it has to be vented in some sense. So as, I, as we talked about last time, the advantage of measuring at constant pressure is that it directly gives you the enthalpy change, and it's the most convenient way to measure chemical changes. So this is going to be vented, which means there's often a little bit of heat loss to the surroundings, but you can correct for that experimentally um, if you wanted to. And it's useful for processes that are occurring in the liquid or solution phase. Because right, obviously if we had a gas phase reaction, we wouldn't want to use a vented calorimeter because our gaseous reactions and products would go everywhere. But if we're talking about a solution reaction or something that's happening in the liquid or solid phase, calorimetry is very convenient for that. So the first application of calorimetry we're going to talk about is using a calorimeter to measure an unknown specific heat capacity. So last time we said that the specific heat capacity of water is 4.184, and we can measure that for any, any single substance that we want, and one way to do that is to use a calorimeter. So the way that this works is that if we want to determine the specific heat of an unknown solid, let's say a piece of metal or a piece of rock or whatever the case is, we're going to take that piece of solid and we're going to heat it up to some temperature. And then we're going to place the solid in cold, or at least colder water, usually room temperature water, that's in the calorimeter. So we take our really hot solid and we just drop it into the calorimeter, which is at ambient temperature, and then heat is going to be transferred between the solid that we drop in there and the liquid that's in the calorimeter. All right, so remember the calorimeter is a coffee cup filled with water, and so whatever heat is coming out of the solid is going to go into the water that's in the calorimeter and then we can measure the temperature change using that thermometer. So we measure the final temperature. We have to also have the initial temperatures of each as well. So we measure both the final and the initial temperatures as part of this process. And remember the, the idea here is that we're, heat is going to be transferred between the solid and the water until the temperatures are equal. So anytime there's a difference in temperature, heat's going to be continuing to be transferred, and as soon as the temperature reaches a final constant value, that's when the heat transfer is stopped, and the heat that comes out of the solid
is equal to the heat that goes into the water. So remember the sign convention that heat that's released is, is thought of as negative, heat that's absorbed is thought of as positive, but the magnitude of the heat is the same. So whatever heat the solid is losing is going into the water, and so then we set these two equal to each other, but opposite in sign. And so that means then we can use that equation, mc delta t, to rewrite this, where we set the two equal to each other. So the mass of the solid times its heat capacity times its change in temperature is equal to the mass of water that's in the calorimeter times the heat capacity for water times its change in temperature. Okay? So the heat that's lost by, this, by, the, by the solid is going to be gained by the water. You set them equal to each other. And then when we do this, typically we're going to be measuring the heat capacity of whatever that solid is that we're interested in. And so we can just solve for that. So you don't necessarily have to memorize this equation, but if you know where it comes from, it's helpful. All right, so we can solve for the unknown heat capacity because we know the masses of each of the substances that are in the calorimeter. We know the heat capacity of water, and then the changes in temperature we measure using the thermometer. That's part of the calorimeter device. So that's how we're going to use this to just determine a physical property, which is just the heat capacity of, of the solid. So let's look at an example of that. So let's say we take a 10 gram so solid and we heat it to 75 degrees Celsius. And then we place it into a calorimeter that contains 50 grams of water initially at 25 degrees Celsius. The water temperature changes to a final value of 26.64. We want to know what is the specific heat capacity of the solid. All right. So remember, it's this, it's this simple equation here where the heat that's gained, the, the, heat, the heat that's lost by the solid, mc delta t for for that solid, is equal to the heat that's gained by the the water, we have to put a negative sign on one side of the equation to keep in mind the sign convention. And then again, then in this typical type of problem, the unknown is going to be the specific heat capacity of the solid that we're interested in. So that heat capacity is just given by the heat term for water with a, with a minus sign in front of it. So now we have to start plugging in values. We see that the, the, this numerator here has all the terms associated with water. So we know that the mass of water is 50 grams. That's how much water is in the calorimeter. The heat capacity of water is given and is something that we should be familiar with, 4.184 joules per grams Kelvin. We need the delta T for the water. We'll get that in a second. And then we have our other given quantity is the mass of solid that we use. We put a 10 gram piece of that solid in there. So that mass in the denominator is also known at the beginning. And so we just need the two delta T terms, delta T for the water, delta T for the solid. Now these are typically not going to be equal to each other. Um, in fact, one's going to have to be negative, one's going to have to be positive. So we need to make sure that we get those correct. So the change in temperature for the water the final temperature of the water was 26.64 degrees Celsius, so where delta T is final temperature minus initial. So we have 26.64 degrees Celsius. The initial temperature we're told is 25 degrees Celsius. So that means the change in temperature for the water is plus 1.64 degrees Celsius, or remember that for a change in temperature that's equivalent to a difference of 1.64 Kelvin, however you want to think about that. we have our delta T for water. And then for the solid, our delta T, we're told that the final temperature of the water changes to 26.64 degrees Celsius. We're not given the final temperature of the solid, but remember that 
the heat is going to stop transferring when the two are the same. So the final temperature for both the water and for whatever object you're placing into the calorimeter are going to be the same. So the final temperature for our solid is also that same value, 26.64. And then the initial temperature for the solid is going to start out at a higher temperature, 75. Because okay, the heat transfer stops when the two temperatures are the same. And so we do 26.64 minus 75, which is minus 48.36, which we can write in either Celsius or Kelvin, if it's, a, if it's a delta T. So then we just put that in here, minus 48.36 Kelvin. And the, so then when we just divide that out, we get 0 0.709 joules per gram Kelvin. So this solid has a much smaller specific heat capacity than water. Um, I think this is the value for iron or something. I forget which, which value I picked for this problem. But metals tend to have very small heat capacity, especially when compared to something like water. But this is how we can find what those heat capacities are. We measure the heat that's transferred between the object and the water. We set the two equal to each other in magnitude, opposite in sign, and then we just solve for whatever our unknown is. All right, so that's a pretty straightforward application of calorimetry. Any questions on that before I move on? Yeah. There's a negative sign on top here, you wrote it. So there's a negative sign up there, so the two negative signs divide out. Um, you should never get a negative value for a specific heat capacity. If you do, then you must have messed something up. All right, so there should be a negative sign in the numerator and the denominator, negative for the delta T for the solid, and then this negative term that comes from the from setting the two heat terms equal to each other but opposite in sign. All right, thanks for clarifying. Any, any other questions? All right, so then the next thing we have to talk about is how we use calorimetry to determine enthalpy changes, delta H. So remember that when we defined delta H last time, we saw that delta H is related to delta E, but it also has this P delta V term built into it. And remember that this is equal to the heat measured at constant pressure. So if we measure the heat at constant pressure in a calorimeter for some chemical reaction, that is going to directly give us delta H. So if we conduct a chemical reaction in a constant pressure calorimeter, we measure Q, that's going to then directly relate to delta H. So the first step in this is going to be to determine the heat that's absorbed or released by the calorimeter. So remember that when we have a chemical reaction happening in the calorimeter, there's going to be some heat that's either absorbed by the reaction if it's endothermic or released by the reaction if it's exothermic. And if the heat is released, it's going to go into the calorimeter. If the heat is absorbed, it's going to come from the calorimeter. So if we can measure that Q term for the calorimeter itself, which is going to be given, what we'll call it the total heat, that's going to be the heat absorbed by the water that's in the calorimeter, plus the heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter itself. All right, so this is where we're going to see some variation in terms of how the information is presented. And you have to be aware of these differences and only use whatever information is given to you. So the heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter, the calorimeter is going to have some water in it. So there's going to be a heat term associated with the water that's in the calorimeter. But then the calorimeter itself, which, as I said, is usually made up of a styrofoam cup, a thermometer, and things like that, that can also absorb some of the heat. The heat's going to go and, and be absorbed by the whole thing. So sometimes we'll give you information for both of these. In some cases, we'll just assume that the heat absorbed by the calorimeter is really small, and we'll just give you the information for how much heat is absorbed by the water. In other cases, we'll just group, group all of these together and only give you a heat term for the calorimeter, which includes the water. And in some cases, we'll give you both pieces of information separately, where we'll say, you know, we have this much water in the calorimeter, and then we also have some information about the calorimeter itself. So there's a lot of variations in terms of how the information can be presented, but like I said, sometimes it involves both of these terms, sometimes it only involves one of them. You just have to look at the given information in the problem and whether they're making any approximations or not. But if we have this information, the key to absorbed by the water is still just MC delta T, And then for the calorimeter, it's going to have the same change in temperature, but it also has its own heat capacity associated with it. 
Now, since the calorimeter is made up of a bunch of different materials, like I said, usually styrofoam, whatever the thermometer is made out of, we don't give a specific heat capacity because it's not a single substance. We just give a total heat capacity, which is also abbreviated capital C, and multiply that by the delta T. Okay, so when we're measuring the heat for a calorimeter, in reality, there's two terms we have to consider, the heat absorbed by the water and the heat absorbed by the calorimeter itself. But like I said, in some cases, we just ignore the heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter. We assume that it's very small. In some cases, we group the two together and just have one total heat capacity for the whole thing. And then in other cases, we um, you know, have to do the two separately. So there's a lot of variations in terms of how we give the information, but this is the general equation that will work. All right, so that's the heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter or released by the calorimeter if it's an endothermic reaction. And then we have to determine delta H, which is going to usually be in kilojoules per mole at the end. So the heat for our reaction is just going to be equal to the negative of the total heat that's absorbed or released by the calorimeter. So remember that the, the reaction is our system, the calorimeter is our surroundings. So whatever heat comes from the reaction or goes into the reaction ends up in the calorimeter or coming from the calorimeter. So you just set the two equal to each other. Q, the Q, the key of the reaction is equal to the minus heat term for the calorimeter. But remember that the heat that's released or absorbed by reaction depends on the scale of the reaction. All right, so if we burn you know, one drop of gasoline, we're gonna get a little bit of heat. If we burn a gallon of gasoline, we're gonna get a lot of heat. So the amount of heat that's involved in the chemical reaction is going to depend on how, mu how much of a scale we conduct that chemical reaction on. So if we want to calculate delta H, which relates usually to a mole of, you know, moles of product or moles of reactant, we have to take the heat of reaction and define it by, define it by the moles of product that are formed. So if we want to compare two delta H values for two different chemical reactions, we want to normalize it to the amount of chemical reaction or the amount of product that's involved in that chemical reaction. Because otherwise, every single time we did a reaction on different scales, we would get a different heat value and it wouldn't really be easy, easy to compare them. So those are kind of the steps involved. Now we'll just go through a bunch of examples of how this works. All right, so as I talked about last time, if we dissolve ammonium chloride in water, a lot of ammonium salts do this, the, it's gonna be an endothermic process. So we'll see if that's, if that's the case here. So we have one gram of ammonium chloride. We add it to 50 milliliters of water in a calorimeter and the final temperature, and the temperature drops from 22.3 degrees Celsius down to 20.98 degrees Celsius. And we want to know what is the enthalpy of dissolution for ammonium chloride in kilojoules per mole. So here we're not really doing a chemical reaction, we're just dissolving an ionic compound, and we want to know what is the enthalpy change associated with dissolving that compound. So we're taking our ammonium chloride as a solid, we're adding it to water, and we're dissolving it to make aqueous ammonium chloride. And we want to know what is delta H for this reaction. All right, so enthalpy changes can be applied to any physical or chemical change. So we're looking for the enthalpy change associated with dissolving ammonium chloride. And we want to know what it is in per mole of ammonium chloride. And that's good, so that's going to also factor in at the end. Okay, so remember the first thing that we're going to do is calculate the heat that's either absorbed or released by the calorimeter itself, which we call the, the total heat, as I've abbreviated. I, don't, I think your book does it a little bit differently, or abbreviates it differently, but it's the same concept. So remember that for, to measure the heat for the calorimeter, we take the mass of water, specific heat of water, and the change in temperature. And then we have to add in a term that involves the total heat capacity of the calorimeter times delta T. Now if you look at the information in this, in this problem, do I tell you anything about the, the total heat capacity of the calorimeter? Anybody see it? All right, it's, silence, which I'm assuming you didn't find it, which is good because it's not there. So all I gave you was the, the amount of water in the calorimeter. I didn't tell you anything about the heat capacity of the calorimeter itself. So we're going to, this is one of those situations where we're going to ignore this term and assume that all of the heat is absorbed by the water, which in, in many cases is a, is a decent approximation. So we're going to ignore this term. We don't have to worry about any heat that's involved with the calorimeter itself. We are just need to calculate the heat that's absorbed or released by the water. So the heat term for the water is just going to be mc delta t. So this also has 50 milliliters of water, which is equivalent to 50 grams. The heat capacity of water is still that same value. 
So also when we're doing calorimetry problems, you know, we are dissolving ammonium chloride in water, but we're going to assume that the mass of the solution is just equal to the mass of the water that's in the calorimeter, the heat capacity doesn't change. We're making some approximations here, but we don't want to, you know, we don't need to get too, you know, in depth with these calculations. We're just assuming that we have that much water and we're assuming that the heat capacity is unchanged when we dissolve the, the ionic compound. We need to find delta T for the water. So delta T is going to be the final temperature minus the initial. So our final temperature is 20.98 degrees Celsius. The initial temperature was 22.30. So our change in temperature is minus 1.32, or we can also write in Kelvin. So the heat term is, I ran out of room again, 276 joules. So that's the heat term associated with the calorimeter. The heat is releasing 276 joules, I'm sorry, the calorimeter is releasing 276 joules of heat. And then finally then we have to realize that the heat for the reaction or the heat of dissolution is equal to the negative of that, which is plus 276 joules. So if the temperature of the surroundings is decreasing, the temperature of the calorimeter is going down, that means we have an endothermic process or a positive delta H. And then the last thing we have to do is realize that this heat here, 276 joules, is the amount of heat that's absorbed by one gram of ammonium chloride. But the question is asking us for the amount of heat that's absorbed by one mole of ammonium chloride. We're looking for what is the enthalpy of dissolution in kilojoules per mole. So this is the amount of heat associated with one gram, so we have to divide it by the moles of ammonium chloride to get it in terms of kilojoules per mole. So we're going to take that value and divide it by the moles of ammonium chloride that we're using in this reaction. So that's plus 276 joules, and then we have to find moles of ammonium chloride. So just review that real quick. The moles of ammonium chloride, we have one gram and I told you that the molecular mass was, or the molar mass was 53.49. And so this one gram of ammonium chloride corresponds to 0 0.0187 moles. So we're going to take that heat value, 276 joules, and divide it by the number of moles. That's going to give us the heat per mole. Which I copy. 187. And then the problem also specifies that we want kilojoules per mole, so our last step is going to be to convert that joules into kilojoules. So that gives us kilojoules per mole, which is going to be a positive number, and it's going to be 14.8. Okay? So it's an endothermic process, 14.8 kilojoules per mole of ammonium chloride when it dissolves. And once again, you have to use we have to keep in mind that this 276 joules is the amount of heat from one gram. We have to divide by moles to figure out the amount of heat per mole. All right, questions on that one? So the next example I have is, is very similar. So here what we have is uh, 50 milliliters of one molar HCl. We put it in a constant pressure calorimeter and we dissolve 1.6 grams of solid sodium hydroxide in there and the temperature increases by 7.27 degrees Celsius. We want to know what is the heat of reaction or the enthalpy of reaction in kilojoules per mole of water formed. All right, so we're going to assume a density of one gram per milliliter and the heat capacity is just the same as that of water. So in this case, we're actually doing a chemical reaction of the calorimeter. We're mixing an acid and a base together. And as we learned in, in chapter six, those two things react with each other. So we're doing this reaction in the calorimeter. So it's a simple acid-base reaction. HCl plus NaOH means water and sodium chloride. About as simple as it gets for acid-base chemistry. 
And then we notice that the temperature of the calorimeter is increasing, the temperature of the surroundings are increasing, so that tells us that this is an exothermic reaction, and we're going to use all this data to figure out how much heat is actually released by that reaction in the situation where one mole of water is forming. Okay? So our... Total heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter, we have to use, again, the MC delta T for water. And then the heat of the capacity of the calorimeter times delta T. Same story in this problem. We didn't give you any information about the heat capacity of the calorimeter. We just told you how much water is in the calorimeter. It's, and we... Um, which is 50 milliliters again, and we just told you the heat capacity. We don't have this term, so we can ignore it again. And so once again, we need to use MC delta T. So we have 50 grams of water. Heat capacity is 4.184. And then the change in temperature, we're told directly, is 7.27 degrees Celsius, increasing by 7.27, so it's a positive number. So in this case, the calorimeter is absorbing 1521 joules of heat. But we want this to be in kilojoules per mole of water, so then the next step is going to be, this is how much heat is released by the reaction when we mix 50 milliliters of one molar HCl with 1.60 grams of NaOH. But we want to know how much heat is released when one mole of water is formed as a product. So we have to figure out how many moles of, product of water are formed in this chemical reaction using this amount of HCl and NaOH. So we have amounts for both of our reactants. So we have to figure out, just like we always do, what's the limiting reactant, and then use that to figure out how much water is formed during the reaction. Okay, so the moles of HCl, we have 50 milliliters of HCl solution. The molarity is 1. So we have 0 0.0500 moles of HCl. And then we have to figure out how many moles of NaOH do we add to that. So the moles of sodium hydroxide. We have, in this case, we're adding it as a solid, so it's 1.60 grams. So the molar mass of sodium hydroxide is 40, as we gave you in the problem. So we have 0 0.0400 moles of sodium hydroxide. All right, these react in a in a one-to-one -one fashion, one HCl plus one NaOH. So the one that's the smaller number of moles is going to be the limiting reactant. So NaOH is the limiting reactant. If we're reacting 0 0.040 moles of NaOH, we're going to also form 0 0.040 moles of our product. So we use the moles of limiting reactant to figure out how much water is formed. So that's the number of moles that are involved in this reaction. So if we want to find delta H in kilojoules per mole, we take the heat of our reaction divided by the moles of water that are formed. So the heat for this reaction, the heat for the calorimeter is 1521, and the heat of reaction is going to be the negative of that. So all the heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter is released by the reaction. So we have minus 1521 joules. We have 0 0.0400 moles. Then we use the conversion to get into kilojoules. And we get minus 38 kilojoules per mole. Okay? So really the, the, the new, only new equation is MC delta T. We're using that to figure out the heat that's absorbed or released by the calorimeter. The heat that's absorbed or released by the reaction is the opposite of that, the negative of that. Then we divide that by the moles that are involved in the chemical reaction to give us the answer in kilojoules or joules per mole. All right, I'm going to leave these next couple for you to, to try on your own. 
Um, so I'll, I'll put the answers in the notes, but we don't really have time to go through them now because I'm going a little slow today. We don't want to miss anything. So this, these will be really the same concept. Um, try them on your own, and I'll have the answers posted in the notes. Good practice for you to, to get started with these. The only difference here, keep in mind, is that here we're mixing together two solutions. So the total amount of water that's in the calorimeter needs to be the sum of those two. So don't get tripped up by that. That's the only difference here is that we're mixing two solutions together. So the heat that's released or absorbed by the calorimeter is going to be going into that full volume, that full 90 milliliters of water. But other than that, the, the calculations are the same. So maybe we'll come back to that if we have time, but most likely we won't. The next thing I want to talk about is constant volume calorimetry. So constant volume calorimetry is very similar in concept. It's just that now we're using a set of a vented calorimeter that keeps the pressure constant. We're completely closing it in. This is also known as a bomb calorimeter. Because as the name suggests, we're putting it, everything into a rigid enclosed container, which you know pressure can certainly build up in there. Um, and so this is sort of a diagram of it. Usually you have you know, this big closed container, and then you'll have a smaller container inside of there where the chemical reaction is taking place. It's going to be surrounded by water. So really it's a similar concept. All the heat that's absorbed or released by the reaction goes into or out of the water that's in the calorimeter. You can measure the temperature change and you can relate that then to the, um, you know, the, the chemical process that's happening. So what are the advantages of, of constant volume calorimetry? Um, they can be used with gases. So when people want to measure the enthalpy change for a combustion reaction, a reaction that involves you know, O2 and forming carbon dioxide and water vapor, it's going to happen at a really high temperature like that. Calorimeter, a, a constant volume calorimeter is a good way to do that because it encloses all of the reactants and products. You don't lose the gases. Um, the other advantage, if you're interested in measuring delta E, this gives you delta E directly. And then finally, the, in many cases, the heat capacity of the calorimeter is known more precisely. And the reason for this is because in a, in a constant pressure calorimeter, where I showed you the diagram earlier, you know, it's basically a vented coffee cup. So you're always going to have some heat that's escaping into the air, in, into the air. Yeah? Yes, I did. There's yeah, measured delta E directly, sorry about that. Um, and the other advantage of this is that the heat capacity is known more precisely because it's a completely enclosed system. So we don't have to worry about the little bit of heat that escapes to the atmosphere and things like that. We have everything completely enclosed. It is really well insulated. We can measure the heat capacity with very good accuracy. We don't have to worry about losing heat to the surroundings. So those are some advantages of constant volume calorimetry. Um, the equations are end up being very similar. So remember that delta H is equal to I want to do this Q plus W. Sorry, that's delta E. I'm really a little struggling right now. Get me out of this. Okay, delta E is Q plus W, which is, as we said, Q minus P delta V. And that work term is, is approximated as pressure times the change in volume. Now, if we're doing this in a constant volume calorimeter, which is completely enclosed, we don't have a delta V term because the change in volume is zero. So what that means then is if we're measuring the heat at constant volume, that's going to be a direct measurement of delta V, of delta E. Because delta E, if we just measure the heat, we don't have a P delta V term anymore. The work is going to be zero because there's no change in volume. So measuring the heat at constant volume directly gives us delta E. All right, so that's the difference then. If we measure 
the heat at a, at a constant pressure that's giving us delta H. If we measure heat at a constant volume, that gives us delta E. And like I said, the two values are often very similar to each other, but technically speaking, we are measuring delta E when we do it at a constant volume. And then the, the other equations are almost identical to what we saw before. The, the negative for the heat of the reaction is equal to the heat of the calorie, the total heat, which is just the mc delta t for the water, plus the total heat capacity of the rest of the calorimeter times delta t. Okay, and like I said, there's many ways to present this information, but it's really the same equation. So we want to be aware of some of the you know, conceptual differences between constant volume and constant pressure calorimetry, but in the end, the mathematics, the, the types of operations that we do to solve the problems is, is really identical. Okay? So let's see an example of a constant volume calorimetry problem, which is really not going to be too much different than, than what we've seen before. So I don't know if you've ever been to Kalashi Factory. This was um, something new to me when I moved to Houston. We didn't have them in the part of the world that I used to live in. Um, they're really popular around here, apparently, and they have a lot of calories, as we'll find out in this problem. So if we take a ranchero kalashi and we homogenize it, and then we burn that in a constant volume calorimeter, so this is actually a real application of calorimetry. If you want to know how many calories or how much energy content is in your food, you can burn it in a constant volume calorimeter and measure it. That's how they actually do it in some cases. So this is what you would do. You would take a portion of that, put it in a calorimeter and burn it. And we're told here that the calorimeter has a heat capacity of 9.121 kilojoules per Kelvin. And if the temperature of the if the temperature rises 6.24 degrees Celsius, we want to know how many kilojoules of energy are stored in an entire ranch or kalashi. Okay? So a few a few different things going on here, but as I'll show you, the, the math is really similar to this that we did before. So the heat for the calorimeter is just going to be given by the mass of the water, that's in the calorimeter, the heat capacity of the water times delta T. Heat capacity of the calorimeter times delta T. All right, if you look at the given information in this problem, in this case, we're not telling you how much water is in the calorimeter, right? There's presumably is some, but we don't tell you what that is. We're just giving you a total heat capacity. So this is a situation where all of the, the heat capacity for the water in the calorimeter is just grouped together into one term. So we don't have this information, we don't have to worry about it. So to find the heat, we just have to multiply the heat capacity of the calorimeter times delta T. Another caveat about uh, calorimetry problems, which doesn't come up in this exact one, but it's something you'll see in the future. This mass term here is only going to be the mass of water that's in the calorimeter. So if we give you that mass, you have to use it, but you're never going to put the mass of the reactants in the chemical reaction, or the mass of whatever you're burning. That never goes here. This mass term is only whatever amount of water is in the calorimeter that's absorbing the heat. It's, it has nothing to do with what the chemical reaction is that's happening in the calorimeter. Okay, so be aware of that. We only want to put a mass, if it's a mass of water here that's given, that amount is not given to us. We're also not giving you the exact mass either, but of, of the, of the clash sheet, but that would never go here anyway. Okay, so we have the heat capacity times delta T, so that's going to give us the heat. So the heat capacity is 9.121 kilojoules per Kelvin. And if you look closely at these units, this doesn't involve a mass. It's just a total heat capacity for the entire calorimeter. And if you multiply that by the change in temperature, which is 6.24, that gives us the, number, the amount of heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter. All right, so when we burn this little piece of food, we get 59.6 kilojoules of, of energy released to the calorimeter in the form of heat. And then the total number of kilojoules for that entire confection is going to be 59.6 kilojoules. And then remember, as I told you in this problem, we're only burning 1 25th of it. We're taking it and we're you know, just taking a small piece of that, because otherwise we'd have way too much heat involved in this. So we, we multiply that by 25, because the sample that we're burning is 1 25th of the total. And so that gives us 1490 kilojoules. So there are 1490 kilojoules of energy inside of a um, inside of a kalashi. If you want to convert that into calories, which is the unit that you're familiar with for food, you basically divide this number by four, and so that's roughly what 400, almost 400 calories in, in one of these guys. And keep in mind they're about 
the size of your hand. So they're pretty calorie dense. But that's how you would measure the energy content in this type of food or any food. You just burn it in a calorimeter. You measure the heat that's absorbed by the calorimeter, and that's going to be then related to the heat content of whatever it is you're burning, whether it's a food or a fuel or anything like that. Yeah? Did I? I probably messed up the math again, didn't I? Uh, that doesn't look right. Let me check the math because I'm, I'm doubting myself again. All right, good, I was right. So, you see, I'm not perfect. I thought I was wrong once. Um, so, uh, that is, I think that's the correct math, but you guys are usually pretty good at telling me when I'm wrong, so please continue to do that if I mess up in the future. Okay, the last thing we're gonna close, yeah? Oh, there we go, that was the part that was wrong. And this is probably a little bit wrong too. So can we off by that? Fourteen twenty two. Okay. Well, we get the idea. All right. So the, the last thing I want to talk about today are what are called consecutive reactions. So, you know, certainly you'll need to practice a lot of these types of calorimetry problems on your own. There's, you know, many variations to, to what I've just showed you today, but really the math, the equations are exactly what I gave you. So there's not going to be any difference there. It's just a, a matter of how you use them for different situations. But what we're going to start moving into now is, okay, this is how we measure enthalpy changes for a chemical reaction. We use calorimetry, but how can we actually calculate them for a chemical reaction where we don't know what the enthalpy change is, but we can then um, use get, you know, other information to help us determine that without having to go and do the measurement. So we're going to get into that next time, but the first thing we have to learn if we haven't seen it yet are what are called consecutive reactions. Okay, So this is going to seem unrelated at the moment, but you'll see how it, how it comes back when we talk what we're talking about next time. So for consecutive reactions, what we have to be aware of is that chemical equations can be added together much in the same way that mathematical equations can be added. So if you've you know, taken algebra courses in your life, you know that if we have two equations with two unknowns, we can add those two equations together to get another equation that's, equi that's also valid. And we can do the exact same thing with chemical reactions. So let's say we have two reactions, and we'll do it very generic to start out with. 3A plus 2B goes to 4C. So let's say that reaction happens, and we also have this other chemical reaction, 4C plus D goes to 3E. So we want to add these two chemical reactions together. Let's say they're happening in sequence. The, the first reaction happens, and then the C that is formed in the first reaction reacts with the D to form a new product. So you can think of this as you know, two reactions happening one after another. And so when we add these together, we get three, what we do is we just add all the reactants and products on each side. So everything that's on the left side of the arrow gets added up into the combined reaction. So we have 3A plus 2B from the first reaction. And then from the second reaction, we have 4C plus D. And then on the product side, we have 4C plus 3E. So the two things that are on the product side for the individual reactions get added together or combined as products in the combined reaction. So that's what we see, and as we talked about with net ionic equations, if we have something that appears on both sides of the arrow, we can cancel it out. So if you look at what we have here, we have four C's on the left side of the arrow, and we also have four C's on the right. So we cancel those species out, and then our final form of the chemical reaction is going to be 3A plus 2B plus D goes to 3E. All right, so the point is if, if that these individual reactions, one and two, if these are valid balanced chemical reactions, the sum of the two, this one down here, is also a valid balanced chemical reaction, chemical equation. And what we define more precisely is 
the, the species that canceled out is what we call an intermediate. So an intermediate is something that forms in one reaction and then is consumed as a reactant in a subsequent reaction. So it's a product of one reaction, it's a reactant in the next reaction. All right, so in this example that I gave you here, species C is gonna be the intermediate in this example. All right, so the intermediate C was formed as a product in the first reaction and then immediately consumed as a reactant in the second reaction. So we call it an intermediate and it cancels out when we add the two reactions together. So that's what we call an intermediate. It's something that cancels out. So then let's look in a little bit more detail about the steps involved with combining two reactions. Because in many cases, as we'll see next time, we want to be able to combine two chemical reactions such that the intermediates do cancel out. And we, so to be able to do that, we have to adjust the coefficients in some cases. So the three steps that are involved are we're going to write out the individual steps. So as another example with real chemicals this time, let's take sulfuric acid and react it with sodium chloride. This is a way of making hydrochloric acid in the lab. You just add sulfuric acid to sodium chloride, and that gives you a nice plume of gaseous HCl. And then if we take this HCl and react it with iron, we can dissolve iron in hydrochloric acid to make iron chloride and hydrogen. All right, so let's see that they say that these are the two individual reactions, and we're told to combine these two chemical equations such that the intermediates completely cancel out. So that's going to be the next step, is we're going to have to adjust coefficients to make sure that the intermediates cancel. All right, so if we look at these two reactions here, we see that HCl is formed as a product in the first reaction and it's consumed in the second reaction as a reactant. So HCl is our intermediate, but we notice that there's only a coefficient of two in front of it in this reaction, but there's, a, but there's gonna be six equivalents, six moles reacting in the second reaction. We want those two to completely cancel out, so we have to adjust the coefficients of the first reaction. So if we triple this coefficient from two to six, now the HCl will completely cancel. But remember, if we adjust the coefficient on one reactant and product, we have to adjust the coefficients on all of them, so that first reaction, we're going to take everything and multiply it by three. So we get this adjusted second, re adjusted first reaction here, which is going to be three H2SO4 plus six NaCl makes six HCl plus three sodium sulfates. So we adjust the coefficients on the first reaction such that our intermediate cancels out. And then at this stage, we can add them together. And so when we do this, we get all the reactants are going to combine. So we have 2Fe plus 6 HCl. And then from the second adjusted reaction, we have 3H2SO4 and 6 NaCl. So we add all the reactants on the left side, and then those are going to form all the products. So from the first reaction, we're going to get two FeCl3s and one H2. And then for the second adjusted reaction down here, we get six HCLs and three sodium sulfate. And if we've done our job right, the intermediates will cancel. So now we have six HCLs on both sides, which cancel out. And so the final form of this reaction would be two iron, plus three sulfuric acids, plus six sodium chlorides, 
yields two iron chloride plus hydrogen plus three sodium sulfates. Should be three H twos. Right. Yeah, that what the first one was in balance. All right, so we can double check that that's balanced, but it should be in this case. All right, so we just have to adjust the coefficients to make sure the intermediates cancel. All right, so I'll, I'll leave the last one also as an example. I went a little slow today, so I guess I didn't get to this one as well, but this is the, the same story, give you a little bit of practice on that. And if you're able to come back at 3, I'll, I'll be back here for the review at that time. <coughs>